This course is based on the textbook, Nutrition for Healthcare Professionals, An Introduction to Disease Prevention. The textbook can only be purchased as an ebook from the publisher, Kendall Hunt, so go directly to their website. You'll find the link to the website on the D2L announcement page. Purchasing the third edition will give you access to the free streaming Diabetic Nation uh, documentary as well as practice quizzes and the diet tracker. The 20th and 21st centuries have been marked by a significant growth in chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and many cancers, all stemming from the obesity epidemic, now ravaging the very fabric of American society. Currently, 73.6% of Americans are either overweight or obese, and as many as 35.4% of children are overweight or obese. The link between disease and lifestyle is so real that epidemiologists estimate that between 65 to 85 percent of all cancers are associated with obesity, diet, or tobacco. This understanding of the contemporary origins of disease places a significant importance on the role of prevention. Indeed, strictly from an economic point of view, it is far more financially advantageous to prevent a disease than it is to cure it. 't understand how to prevent disease it's perhaps timely to look back briefly uh, at the dietary evolution of our hominid ancestors many archaeobotanists have argued that the Paleolithic man ate mostly berries and plants and some meats and was essentially nomadic the diet makeup some have suggested consisted of carbohydrates representing 22 to 40 percent of calories protein 19 to 35 and fats 25 to 59 percent of calories now disagreement arises over whether the paleolithic diet was low in carbohydrates indeed because of the massive berries and plants consumed the carbohydrate intake would have been more likely 44 to 64 percent of calories suffice to say that the glycemic index would have been low moreover the level of ex exercise associated with these people would have been very elevated the transition now to the Neolithic period would have caused a shift from nomadic lifestyle to agricultural communities with significantly less physical activity compared to the constant activity of the Paleolithic nomadic lifestyle. So this combination of agriculture and low activity would have been the mix that began to cause disease rates to increase, in part because of the lower physical activity, but also because of the narrower food selection, causing less access to varied micronutrients. Additionally, the cultivation of grains with higher glycemic indexes could have been at the source of some medical problems, but it would not have created a surge in chronic diseases or widespread malnutrition. Plain and simple, the Homo erectus of the Paleolithic period would have likely have been physically fit beyond anything observable during the Neolithic period. Plus, he would have consumed many foods with a low glycemic index. By comparison to our current um, protein intake, we could see that the Paleolithic man is approximately uh, consuming the same amount of protein as we do now. It's certain once agricultural societies emerged, the disease rates began to increase. By the classical Greek period, beginning around 500 BC, Greek thinkers began to reflect about diseases this notion of nutrition critical in disease prevention upheld as a preventative and medicinal approach by the physicians of the greek classical period 500 to 336 bc was rooted in the understanding that human disease was intertwined with the imbalance of nature 
The pre-Socratic philosopher in Pedocles of Agrigentum, 490 to 430 BC, advanced that the four elements, water, fire, earth, and air, were critical in man's understanding of the universe and of his own biology. The Empedoclean model of water, fire, earth, and air advanced that there was a link with the characteristics of the four seasons, cold, moist, hot, and dry, and thus the four humors of the body. The idea was that an imbalance in the humors could only come from disruption in the cold, moist, hot, dry properties of the body that were linked to nature. Hippocrates, a little time later, 460 to 375 BC, universally considers the father of medicine, adopted the model to a more practical hands-on approach to understanding disease and healing. In that sense, he proposed that an imbalance between the humors would lead to sickness, an idea upheld by Plato and Aristotle in later years. The humors uh, were identified as specific fluids within the body. First, the black bile related to earth with cold and dry properties, then the yellow bile related to fire with dry and warm properties. Next, the blood related to air with moist and warm qualities, and the phlegm related to water with moist and cold qualities. Hippocrates, influenced by the teachings of Herodicus, 500 BC, believed in both the importance of diet and exercise for good health. He writes, eating alone will not keep a man well. He must also take exercise. Plato continued to advocate for the balance of the humors and of the modern you know, of hot and cold, moist and dry properties of the body. However, he introduces the notion of diseases of secondary formations originating from insufficient food or drink to replenish the blood. Most significantly, Plato proposes a fourth cause of disease, imbalances of the soul and mind. Here we witness during the classical Greek period evidence that the early medical discipline had already understood the importance of psychological health. Although these concepts were underived from experimentation, but only from rational thought or reason, they clearly introduced a medical model that endured up until the 19th century. Still today, many aspects of this Greek medical model are upheld by the medical field. Beginning with the understanding that excess and deficiencies in diet and exercise can actually lead to disease. Hippocrates understood this. Back in the Greek classical period, he documented obesity, which he termed corpulence. In addition, the Greeks introduced this idea of balance or homeostasis. Uh, the relationship with the world around us needs to bring needs to be in balance in order to balance the humors because an imbalance of humors would actually lead to disease. Now, although this is physiologically incorrect, they did understand the aspect of balance, which we upheld today with a greater understanding, that of metabolic balance, uh, this idea of homeostatic balance within the biological system. In addition, they introduce the whole aspect of balance of the health um, of mind and soul, a very important part uh, which uh, we rediscovered with um, psychology today. This whole idea of keeping stress and anxiety in check, they understood this way back in the Greek classical period. However, at a large scale, we can say that the most significant vectors that have influenced human health have been famines, malnutrition, and plagues. Indeed, it's very clear that famines have frequently affected different societies. Chinese, for example, uh, have been affected um, from 100 BC to about 1910 AD by a total of 1,800 famines. The British Isles, uh, 200 famines. Uh, Europe, from 1308 to 1332, just prior to the major plagues, um, several famines uh, swept through Europe during that particular time. We also have malnutrition resulting in the 18th century from the agricultural revolution. 
uh, more output was required uh, from agricultural facilities and farms and so forth to feed greater population. Therefore, greater prices were coming up. And we saw a shift from subsisting um, subsistence small farms to large commercial farms focused on single crops. Certainly, the famous French Paris famine of 1709 illustrates this 18th century phenomena. Consequently, persistent low starvation for about 40% of Europeans became a, real, a reality uh, where we saw landless and jobless workers uh, roaming the European uh, countryside looking for work. So as a result, there's frequent low-grade famines that are devastating France uh, roughly around 1789. And um, between 1792 and 1795, uh, caused an overt physical manifestation of diseases as a result of this. So the immune system of the Europeans were weakened and they became devastated by disease. By the 19th century, we see the Industrial Revolution kick in, and here we start to see people to migrating uh, in great numbers from rural areas where uh, the impact of the agricultural revolution had been felt, and there were a lot of jobless uh, workers, a lot of migrant um, uh, farm workers that were looking for jobs, and they basically start to migrate towards the urban centers in search of the high higher paying factory jobs. The urbanites, unlike the rural dwellers, started to experience outbreaks of scurvy. Why did this happen? Well, they had depleted the reserves of cabbage and leeks and onions, which were all high in vitamin C, uh, over the winter. Again, remember in the cities there was no storage facilities, grocery stores were not there. This whole migration towards the cities was a new phenomena. This left a diet that was limited only to meat and bread until the spring. So consequently, by the spring, scurvy started to break out. So what took place was very interesting. Food production changed dramatically to an industrial scale production to accommodate the large population base now conglomerating in the cities. The urbanization process made acquiring and consuming all manners of food like milk and apples and meats uh, and so forth, an anxiety-provoking process. So this was because the, um, the mothers that were going out to purchase food for the family uh, were bringing foods that had been putrefied and affected by, by bad hygiene, and so consequently making uh, family members sick. So it was an anxiety-provoking process. Consequently, during that time, the incentive, especially between 1870 and 1930, was very high to develop a, a very, very workable canning industry that could sort of bring uh, the secure food that the people were looking for. The American household was also being transformed. Looking specifically at the 19th century early on, we could see that 85% of manufactured goods were generated directly from the household in 1800. And by 1830, uh, we could see that um, the family had basically become more of a purchasing unit rather than a manufacturing unit. The dramatic decline in household self-sufficiency within a generation translated into a more commercial dependency on food. In other words, the house whole was basically going out of the home to basically purchase or acquire the foods it needed rather than grow it. In fact, the number of commercial bakeries increased 700%, causing homemade bread to drop from 80% to a mere 6% of all bread produced in the United States by 1920. So malnutrition was beginning to pepper the United States, as well as a lot of the consequences of food impurity. So at the beginning of the 20th century, the USDA food economists devised a new food guide consisting of 12 food groups, and they were recommending a liberal consumption of bread. And this liberal consumption of bread, while wise if bread is uh, in fact quite healthy, uh, wouldn't have been so bad, but uh, in, the, in the wake of the mechanization of milling and the production of poor quality flour, uh, this created a disaster. 
malnutrition became prominent uh, around the United States because of um, the love affair of Americans with white bread. And 50% of the calories uh, from American adults uh, was coming from actually white bread. The white flour was so heavily processed, starting in the early parts of the 20th century with mechanized milling, the bleaching process, and so forth, that there were very few, if any, nutrients present in flour. Add to that the fact that the, ble the bleaching process initially introduced with nitrogen trichloride and then banned by the FDA got adapted with another um, bleaching agent called chlorine dioxide. Even the U.S. Army recruits were actually quite malnourished. So what ends up happening, of course, here is um, quite a disturbing um, uh, effect of processing affecting the American public at all aspects, at all levels. In addition to all of this, the meatpacking industry was deplorably controlled. The Jungle, the book published by Upton Sinclair, showed how the packing industry was actually completely um, out, out of control and, um, and very with a very high prevalence of uh, unsanitary practices, consequently leading to poor quality meat distribution within the United States. So this book single-handedly um, caused the, um, uh, the American public to want uh, a pure food, and indeed a pure, the Pure Food Act of 1906 and the Meat Inspection Act of 1906 got instituted in Congress because of this outcry which the book was able to produce. It was clear that during the Great Depression of 1929, the dietary quality of Americans was seriously compromised. In fact, an assessment by the government using key home economists and dietitians looked at key foods such as milk, butter, tomatoes, citrus fruits, and they concluded that in order for the American people to um, increase their diet to the standard of a good diet, they needed to achieve the following. 20% more milk, 15% more butter, 35% increase in egg consumption, 70% more tomatoes and citrus fruit, and 100% increase in vegetables. These were all the products that were being rationed and that were limited to the population at the time. It's very clear that in addition to malnutrition and the great famines that the plagues played a clear and significant role in disease process and in wiping out large fragments of the human population. There really are two noteworthy plagues to pay attention to, the bubonic and pneumonic plagues that swept through Europe during the 14th century and um, all through the Middle Ages right up until the early parts of the 18th century. Then the second was the 19th century cholera plague that affected Europe, noteworthy were France and England, uh, before it came over into the Americas as well. Now what's interesting about the cholera epidemic is that it wasn't really specifically medical interventions that contained the epidemic uh, because the antibiotics had not yet been devised, but it was really public health measures taken by Edwin Chadwick uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Most notably, the most influential uh, was the actual national system of um, sewers and waterways that were modernized in London and the same technology then moved over into the United States. So then historians conclude uh, quite accurately that the cholera epidemic ended both because of a dramatic improvement in public hygiene and because of the lower classes greater purchasing power that gave them access to better food and better living conditions. In this next section of chapter one, I'm going to focus on the rise in chronic diseases. The cumulative impact of these chronic diseases were so significant in the United States that between 1980 and 2017, we saw total health expenditure grow from 256 billion a year to 3.5 trillion. In 2010, um, slightly more than 50% of all healthcare expenditures originated from hospital care and from physician and clinical services. 
the CDC now estimates that about 75% of total health care costs are tied to chronic disease. The American public is so sick with chronic diseases that the strategy for prevention is not yet implementable. In fact, since the 1980s, we could say that the most significant contributor to the epidemic of chronic diseases in the United States is actually obesity. Many secondary diseases are derived from obesity, hypertension, atherosclerosis, gallbladder disease, sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes, and various cancers, including depression. But the paradox is that physicians will rarely address the obesity issue in their family practice. From a dietary management perspective, let's see what's at play. Well, since the 1970s, the diet has been a constant problem. Too much saturated fat, too much dietary cholesterol, too much total fat, and too much total sodium, all because our diet is just very heavily processed and very focused on meat consumption. In 1977, the Senate Select Committee, headed by Governor George McGovern, along with the scientific community, attempted to impose or recommend healthy ranges for carbohydrate intake. 55 to 60 percent had been basically established. Also, in order to maintain lower risks of heart disease and cardiovascular disease in the population, less than 30 percent of calories should come from fat. The data wasn't strong enough to quantify any limits for saturated fat. Dietary cholesterol should still be less than 300 milligrams. And for the very first and last time, we see the government uh, recommending a limit on total sugar, less than 15% of calories. Salt, less than 3 grams. So what we see is the committee imposing limits on salt and sugar because of the highly processed nature of our diet. We wanted to bring us towards eating healthier foods that were less processed. But we we also see meat intake getting specifically um, targeted uh, in order to decrease fat and saturated fat intake. Now, uh, the cattle ranchers of America uh, didn't like this, and they hired hard-hitting lobbyists uh, to basically tell the government not to impose any further um, limits on meat consumption. Pressures from the scientific community's recommendation to decrease meat ingestion because the scientific data sort of suggested that there was a certain carcinogenity to high meat consumption. That was changed to decrease consumption of animal fat and choose meats, poultry, and fish, which will reduce saturated fat intake. Sort of recommendation that still, in the end, didn't harm the meat industry as seriously as it should have. The true nefarious atherogenicity of the trans fats emerged about 13 years later when Willits and his colleagues from Harvard confirmed in 1993 that trans fat did cause LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, to increase and HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, to drop and markers of inflammation to increase. The 1979 food pyramid that emerged from the recommendations from the 1977 Senate Select Committee basically identified for the first time that overeating was a significant problem and pointed the finger at a culprit of uh, different foods that needed to be consumed more sparingly. The 1979 Healthy People's Report concluded that it was indeed possible to lower disease rates by adopting healthy dietary practices. This Healthy People Report uh, influenced the 1980 Dietary Guidelines for Americans that were formulated based on this report. Subsequently, every five years afterwards, new dietary guidelines began to emerge, notably the 1985 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Looking at the Surgeon General's 1988 report on nutrition and health, we get a clearer understanding of the health of the nation. The report promoted a dietary pattern that emphasized consumption of vegetables, fruits, whole grain product foods, rich in complex carbs and fiber, and of fish, poultry without skin, lean meats, low-fat dairy products, selected to reduce the consumption of, indeed, so total fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol. Subsequent to the Surgeon General's report, the 1989 National Research Council's Food and Nutrition Board issued 
clarifications by quantifying the limits on total fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol. We can see here that they stay firm with the idea that uh, better um, that there's a better population improvement in cardiovascular risk when total fat is less than 30% of calories. And they quantify saturated fat limits at less than 10% and continue to promote cholesterol, that is dietary cholesterol, at less than 300 milligrams. The emphasis here was to consume more fruits and vegetables during this time and to increase starches and other complex carbohydrates by eating at least six servings per day of breads and cereals in addition to legumes, which are, you know, chickpeas and soybean and lentils and fava beans and, um, and foods of that nature. In the wake of these recommendations, we see several organizations, notably the USDA, get together and create a five-a-day fruit and vegetable ca campaign to incite the U.S. population to increase their fruit and vegetable consumption to a minimum of, of five per day because it had become clear that their consumption of fruit and vegetables was very suboptimal. In 1990, Dietary Guidelines for Americans were put together by the Department of Health and Human Services and the USDA. They advocated here for 30% or less of calories to be dedicated to fats, to total fat, um, the importance of maintaining a healthy weight, saturated fat, again, being recognized um, from the Council's recommendation of less than 10% of calories, total cholesterol, again, less than 300 milligrams, and then more fruits, vegetables, and grains in the diet, and um, also uh, using um, sugar and sodium in moderation, all basically reflections of problems uh, in the American diet that was actually being uh, documented by epidemiologists and nutritionists, notably the uh, very low intake of fruits and vegetables in the diet and the heavy processing of food um, that was taking place and that was modifying the diet in which there was a lot of sugar and a lot of sodium. So the focus makes a lot of sense. Bring the sugar down, bring the sodium down because they're already too elevated. The 1992 Food Pyramid instituted these changes that were recommended by the Council. The proportionality of the pyramid really demonstrated this. At the base, for instance, we see the preponderance of foods such as grains and cereals and so forth, emphasizing that this should be the foundational base of the diet. Fruits and vegetables, an entire row, emphasizing again the role of at least five fruits and vegetables a day. Then we see the dairy and the meats. Now, what's not really emphasized in the meat and alternates uh, are the... Um, uh, the legumes. So we don't, we do see the nuts, but that's about all that we see. But we should have dry beans in there. Uh, that should be emphasized more visually. And then at the top, we see that uh, fats are not considered very important. It's really part of the philosophy at the time, sort of a fear of fat. We had at the time a lot of uh, low-fat products, uh, low-fat, no-fat salad dressings, low-fat, no-fat spreads, and so forth. Uh, but what the pyramid did not really demonstrate is that there was a difference between fats. In this case, all fats were considered bad or of the same ilk. So consequently, improvements needed to come along where uh, an emphasis on better kinds of fats versus um, you know, poorer types of fats. The 2005 pyramid came along to bring balance and understanding of the importance of exercise and diet in, um, in uh, generating better health. What we see here, however, is the strips for the pyramid are not as revealing as the previous pyramid. And consequently, we see uh, the meat and alternates uh, representing uh, not necessarily uh, as visually as striking of a smaller place in the pyramid uh, as we see in the previous pyramid, right? We see here that um, the stripes are relatively the same with very minor changes. The limitation of this version of the pyramid is that we don't quite visually uh, 
understand the importance or the preponderance of grains, vegetables, and fruit in the diet uh, relative to the meats. This is a little bit of the influence of the cattle ranchers who had strong lobbyists in government that were really trying to find a way to um, carve a significant or maintain a significant place for the meats and alternates uh, in the diet. The data um, sort of negatively uh, painting uh, meats uh, was getting stronger but still was not strong enough uh, to be able to make a significant mark on the design. of. Five years later, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2010 focused on key social issues. First, poverty and second, the rising um, prevalence of overweight and obesity among men, women and children. Indeed, 15% of American households at that time had been able to acquire uh, adequate food to meet their needs on a regular basis. Rising concern about the health of Americans was also on the agenda. Poor diet, poor levels of physical activity, most importantly contributing to the epidemic of overweight and obesity uh, in the adult and um, pediatric population. By 2015, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans remained a little bit the same, but the message was a little more subtle. First, maintain caloric balance over time in order to sustain a healthy weight. This, intimated in the message, was achieved through diet and also through exercise. But the second focus was really nutrient-dense foods and beverages. And this was a subtle way uh, to basically recommend staying away from processed foods and also soda pop, although the guidelines didn't outrightly condemn um, soft drinks. Seven key points were being advanced by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans in 2015. And the first at the top is to keep uh, sodium intake under 2300 milligrams, keep the saturated fat to less than 10%, replacing it with monounsaturated and with polyunsaturated oils. The emphasis, though, should be on mono. Consume less than 300 milligrams of uh, cholesterol, keep the trans fats at, at bay, limiting foods that contain synthetic sources of trans fats, that's a lot of your baking products, hydrogenated oils, and limiting the intake of solid fats. Reduce the intake of calories from solid fats and added sugar. Limit the consumption of foods that contain refined grains, especially those grains and foods that contain solid fat, sugar, and sodium. That's really most of the processed food industry. And then alcohol for women, one drink per day. For men, two drinks per day for those who are of legal age. Now, the main message from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans in 2015 was to look at a variety of vegetables, to include dark green vegetables, dark red vegetables, and legumes, to look at a variety of proteins, not just red meat, but also, you know, fish and uh, poultry and legumes of different types, soy products, nuts and eggs, lower fat dairy products and fortified soy beverages, fortified cereals and so forth, and to look at increasing you know, dietary fiber, calcium, potassium, uh, vitamin D. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2020-2025 actually is a carryover from the 2015 ones. Concern here is basically the intake of calcium, potassium, fiber, and vitamin D. These are major concerns for the population, in addition to iron, particularly for infants. Added sugar uh, is also recognized as being excessive in the population, needs to be less than 10% of the calories. Saturated fat also needs to be less than 10% of DRI calories. Sodium intake, because of the highly processed nature of the food that we consumed is also very high and so the recommendation is to have a uh, total daily sodium intake below 2300 milligrams per day and if you're under um, 14 years of age it should even be less than that possibly 1500 and then of course alcohol be alcoholic beverages need to be two drinks per day for men and about one drink per day or less for women pregnant women of course should not have any alcohol the Healthy People 2020 guidelines overlapped Healthy Eating Guidelines 2010 and 2015. Their, the goal of these guidelines was to encourage healthy eating, to avoid the saturated fat, to avoid the trans fats, 
cholesterol, added sugar, sodium, and alcohol, and to avoid weight gain and also encourage weight loss. Now, the Healthy People Guidelines 2030 really overlap uh, the Healthy Eating Guidelines of 2020-2025. The focus is definitely on helping people eat healthier foods, more fruits, more vegetables, more whole grains, and focus again on calcium, potassium, vitamin D, and fiber. It identifies the culprit of chronic diseases like obesity, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and other problems as being tied to the consumption of foods high in saturated fat and added sugar. These tend to be the highly processed foods. The goals also aim to increase physical activity to reduce the risk of food insecurity and hunger in the home. This became especially relevant in light of the COVID-19 lockdowns. In searching for what is a healthy diet, we first have to take a look at what makes up an unhealthy diet. I'm going to start this discussion by beginning on page 6 of the textbook and looking at the seven errors of the Neolithic diet, notably the higher glycemic index, uh, the deviancy in the fatty acids consumed that we see currently in our you know, agricultural Neolithic society, um, the altered macronutrient composition that would have taken place from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic, but probably um, greatly modified uh, after the Industrial Revolution. A decrease in micronutrient density, disruption of the acid-base balance of our food supply, and a disturbance in the sodium-potassium ratio, and finally the lower fiber intake. All right, so what is a high glycemic index food? Well, first of all, the glycemic index is a measure of the capacity of one serving of carbohydrate-based food to increase the blood sugar within a defined period of time in comparison to a pure glucose or a pure refined carbohydrate. As such, uh, various carbohydrate foods can uh, follow a scale of 0 to 100, uh, based on the capacity to increase that blood sugar level. As such, a high glycemic index food would have a value between 70 and 100, whereas a um, more moderate um, glycemic index would be 55 to 69, and a low glycemic index would be less than 55. In the second column of Table 1.1, uh, you'll find the glycemic index of a variety of foods. Now, the textbook describes two methods of measuring the glycemic load, which is different than the glycemic index. There's the glycemic load technique 1, and there's the glycemic load technique 2. So we're going to look at the glycemic load technique 1 first. So this first technique consists first of taking the glycemic index and multiplying it by the grams of carbohydrate listed in one serving and then dividing it by 100 grams. So for instance, a food that has a glycemic index of 74 uh, would multiply then the number of grams on a food label for a specific food. Say, for example, the label indicates 20 grams of carbohydrate in a 130-gram serving. Well, this glycemic load then would be calculated by multiplying the glycemic index, 74, by the number of grams of carbohydrates in that one serving, 20, and then dividing it by 100, which would give you about 14.8, which could be basically rounded up to 15. The glycemic load 2 technique uh, resembles this one, except that many argue that it's probably more realistic of the true glycemic load. So, how does the technique work? Glycemic index times the grams of carbohydrate per serving divided by the weight of one serving rather than just simply um, 
uh, an across the board 100 grams. So in this case, a food that has a glycemic index of 74 would multiply the grams of carbohydrate in one serving, that's times 20. But here, rather than divide by, like I said, a flat 100 grams right across all foods, it divides the number of grams in one serving. So here, divided by 30. So in this case, we get a 49 glycemic load. Well, what does this mean? Well, if we take a product like brown rice, we could see that the glycemic load technique one and technique two resemble each other, 18 and 21. The difference really appears when we start looking at products like cornflakes, just a few rows up higher. The glycemic index 1 gives us 21, indicating that it's not that much of a glycemic load. Perhaps it's good to eat. But when we do the glycemic load calculation 2, we see that it's actually at a 70. And this is because, again, we've divided glycemic index times number of grams of carbohydrate divided by actually the weight of one serving as indicated on the label. So we get a better reflection of the carbohydrate load or the glycemic load, if you will, of the product. And we can see that the more processed it is, uh, the higher that load would tend to be. The second deviancy that we see in the diet is the fatty acid makeup. First of all, our total fat currently represents approximately about 40% of calories uh, versus what the Paleolithic diet possibly had, uh, which was about 21%. Now, if we look at healthy eating standards, we can see that healthy eating recognizes that we can be healthy if we consume between 20 to 35 percent of our calories from fat. So it's very clear that we can improve our fat consumption first by decreasing it. This is true. But the other thing that's uh, re that's there that's in a negative is the amount of omega-6 fatty acids, the um, polyunsaturated vegetable oils that we're consuming. We're consuming too many of these. And when we look at it in terms of a ratio, uh, the ratio of, uh, of omega-6 to omega-3 is much larger than what it should be if we base it on 19th century and very early 20th century dietary makeups. The overall macronutrient makeup is quite different when we look at protein and carbohydrates specifically. So we see a decline, uh, should we say, in protein intake from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic period. On average, 25% down to about 15%. The intake range varies quite a bit. Uh, 19 all the way to 35% of calories are coming from protein during the Paleolithic period uh, versus what we currently consume 10 to 20%. The carbohydrate intake would have gone up as um, the population transitioned from a Paleolithic diet to a Neolithic diet. So roughly 22 to 40% of calories would have been coming uh, from carbohydrates during the Paleolithic period and as we transitioned over to a Neolithic we're looking at 45 to 65 percent which we consume today. The intake range varied uh, quite significantly depending on who's making the argument but to give the arguments justification we can say that uh, many argue that the Paleolithic period carbohydrates were actually a lot higher than what some uh, archaeologists or archaeobotanists would have suggested, uh, as high as 44 to 64 percent. And this, again, as previously mentioned, because of the number of berries and wild berries and plants that they were consuming. As you can see on this slide, the fat intake varied quite significantly 25 to 59 percent of calories on the paleo diet. Uh, and uh, this would have depended on. Uh, the amount of meat consumed, which varied on depending on the success of the kill or the success of the hunt, uh, it would have depended on seasons and so forth. So the micronutrient density of our diet would have been greatly compromi compromised because of the total amount of sugar that we're actually taking in, currently representing about 36.2% of calories in this, uh, in the aftermath, of course, of the Industrial Revolution and also the infiltration of sugar into the diet uh, during the 18th and 17th century. So from 1992 to 1994, about 50% of Americans 
uh, were not able to meet their RDAs for a great variety of nutrients. And what the NIH's own data basically shows is that when the number of calories coming from sugar exceeds 20%, there is a significant decline in the quality of nutrition as measured by key nutrients. So what is understood by nutrient density? Well, it's the milligrams of nutrient per individual calorie. For example, um, 300 milligrams of calcium in one cup of milk, which contains about 125 calories. The nutrient density of this particular product is the amount of calcium, 300 milligrams, divided by the total number of calories in that one serving, 125 ca calories. So what we get for nutrient density is 2.4 milligrams of calcium per calorie. This is what we call nutrient density. Now by comparison, caloric density is a little different. It's the number of calories per gram of food. So for instance, one medium donut weighing 42 grams has 195 calories. Well, the caloric density of the donut is 195 calories divided by its weight. So what we're getting is 4.64 calories per gram. Well, why don't you contrast that with an apple? 182 grams. There are 94 calories. The caloric density, 94 calories divided by 182 grams. And what do we get? 0.52 calories per gram. So we can see that the natural foods have very few calories per singular individually measured weight of a gram, but that the processed foods have a much higher caloric density, so many more calories per singular gram of product. The other unhealthy feature about our diet is the acid-base balance it has been disrupted. What we have are, first of all, acid-yielding foods and base-yielding foods. So the acid-yielding foods are the dairies, the meats, the cereals, grains, and salt. And this would theoretically, notably the acid-yielding foods, too much dairy, too much meat, and too many cereal products and salt, of course sodium being part of salt, would have generated a low-grade metabolic acidosis. So what's generally recommended is balance all this off with base-yielding foods, fruits, vegetables, tubers, and nuts. So when we have a good distribution of our diet that balances off these things, uh, we avoid low-grade metabolic acidosis getting produced in the body. So this is certainly an argument against going back to the misunderstood concept of the paleo diet, which many think means eating more meat. There's nothing in our current understanding of health, and there's nothing really in, from an archaeobotanist point of view that appears to indicate that they were eating obnoxiously amount um, uh, you know, great amounts of meat during that period of time. What we tend to believe, and it appears to be true, uh, is that fruits, vegetables, tubers, and nuts need to be more prominent in our diet and balanced with an adequate amount of cereals and grains, and yes, dairy indeed, and with some meats, but not excessive meats. So what we know about the sodium-potassium ratio is that when there's an upward shift of this ratio, that means more sodium relative to potassium, there's an increase in hypertension, there's an increase in the population level of cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and intestinal cancers. When is it that we see the sodium-potassium ratio rise? Very simply, when there's an abundance of processed foods coming into the diet. And finally, the next and final um, deviance in our diet is the overall lower intake of fiber because of the processing. So the hunter-gatherer would have consumed approximately 42 grams per day in fiber. Uh, our current mean intake of fiber is about 15 grams per day, and the RDA will vary um, depending on what organization, but it goes between 25 to 40 grams per day. So what this tells us is that we need, as a modern society, to up our game on uh, fiber intake. And the best way to do that is to eat more whole grains, more fruit and vegetables, for sure. But one surefire way is to include a high-fiber cereal in the morning in order to meet our daily requirements.
So in 2011, a new design, new concept came out, um, used as a teaching tool for the population. It's the 2011 MyPlate Food Guide, and it can be found at choosemyplate.gov. This particular food guide moved away completely from the pyramid concept to introduce a plate, something more familiar, perhaps many have argued, that is a more teachable instrument. Looking at the plate, the main message that we get is three quarters of our plate need to be fruit, vegetables, and grains, with one quarter of the plate representing protein. The other notable uh, visual that comes out is we no longer call that purple segment meat and alternates, but rather protein. And this is because the scientific data on meat intake was very conclusive and persuasive. The higher the meat intake, uh, the larger or the more uh, or the greater the rise in prominence of disease. And so the idea was that uh, meat needed to still be included in the diet, but we don't really push meat, we push the proteins. And it's the proteins that can be grain, that not, it could be egg, it can be meats of various types, the red meats, the white meats, uh, the legumes, and so forth. As long as they're protein, uh, they will influence or impact our diet positively. So now I want to take a closer look at the food group choices of the MyPlate food guide. So now if you go to page 30 in your textbook, it shows you basically how to access the choosemyplate.gov um, food guide. And I want you to become familiar with what one serving or one ounce equivalent is for the various food groups. I'm going to give you some examples here on this, power, on this uh, basic um, a movie clip, but I need you to go back to the website and actually practice understanding what one serving or one ounce equivalent is for the various foods. And this is, of course, very important for any healthcare professional that's dealing with food to understand uh, how to assess a patient's uh, dietary intake at the first level, which is uh, taking into account what they're consuming and being able to organize it and say you are meeting your requirements for fruit, for vegetables, for grains, for protein, for dairy, right? That's the first level of assessment. And this is what this particular segment is for, is to increase your uh, confidence and also your skill level in assessing an individual's diet. So overall, the guide is essentially providing recommendations that meet the needs of most individuals. And the caloric uh, range is roughly 16 to 2,400 calories per day. So we're looking at 1.5 to 2 cup equivalent of fruit per day, 2 to 3 cups of vegetable equivalent uh, per day. Uh, and the focus on dark green, orange, starchy legumes as well. Consume at least 50% of all grains as whole grains. So choose foods of high nutrient density. Go back and review what nutrient density is and control those foods that have high caloric density. Again, go back and restudy and review what these two concepts are and how they're actually calculated. Okay, the first group that we're looking at are breads and cereals, and we're going to be looking at the equivalent of one ounce equivalent of breads and cereals. You can do the same by going on to the choosemyplate.gov website, follow the instructions uh, that are um, uh, written out in your textbook and how to get to these particular um, sites or, or specific locations on the website. But this is what we have. An ounce equivalent of bread and cereal is a half a cup of cooked rice. It's a half a cup of macaroni, spaghetti, or pasta. It's a slice of bread. One mini bagel or a half of a medium-sized bagel. A cup of cold cereal like cornflakes or one and a quarter cup if you're using puffed. Uh, half a cup of cooked cereal if you're using oatmeal or cream of wheat, uh, one medium or two small pancakes, and three cups of popcorn. Uh, there are other examples on the website, and I invite you to go and check them out. So if the patient you're assessing says, I had a cup of rice for lunch, you can basically say, oh, you've had two ounce equivalent of bread and cereal with that particular cup of rice. If your patient says, I've had two sandwiches, that would basically mean four ounce equivalent of bread and cereals because one slice of bread is one ounce equivalent. 
Now let's look at the vegetable group. Well, one cup equivalent is one cup of vegetables, frozen, canned, or fresh. A half a cup of tomato sauce, because it's a little more concentrated. Two cups of leafy raw vegetables, like spinach or lettuce. That's because it's less dense. One cup of vegetable juice, like a V8. One cup of cooked legumes, like a pinto beans, black beans, and kidney beans. And here you've got to be careful because the beans uh, legumes specifically can count as a vegetable, but they also count as a protein. And I want you to take very clear note of what one um, equivalent is for legumes when they're counted as a protein. One large corn on the cob, one cup of corn, one medium boiled or baked potato, and one cup of mashed potato. So you can see it's pretty straightforward. The principles are very similar. It's one cup basically as a general rule is equivalent, uh, one cup equivalent of a vegetable. And then there are modifiers there, which are very logical. So if your patient says, I've had two cups of uh, lettuce for a salad, or that would be the equivalent of one vegetable equivalent. But if they had four cups because they're having a larger salad, that would be two cups equivalent. Similarly, if the patient is describing what they had for their meal and they said, well, I had a cup of mashed potatoes and I had a cup of corn uh, and I had a cup of frozen vegetables, that would be the equivalent of three cup equivalent of vegetables. Now for protein foods, well, we talk about an ounce equivalent of meat, poultry, fish, eggs, or beans. So let's take a look. Here's what I wanted you to pay attention to. So one cup, if you remember, of legumes um, counts as one um, cup equivalent for vegetables. But a quarter cup of cut legumes is really one ounce equivalent of protein. Here again, so that's a quarter cup. Uh, of legumes. So if patient says I've had a cup of um, fava beans for, uh, for supper, that really is four ounce equivalent. Uh, one ounce for tofu, half an ounce of nuts or seeds, one egg, and of course the easy one is one ounce of cooked meat, poultry, or fish is one ounce equivalent, and a tablespoon of peanut butter is one ounce equivalent. So if a patient said, uh, for breakfast I put two tablespoons roughly of peanut butter on my bread, I had one egg, you can say that that was the equivalent of three ounce equivalent of protein. Okay, now let's take a look at the fruit group. Here we're talking about a fruit, uh, one cup fruit equivalent, and what is that? Well, it's a cup of juice, it's a cup of frozen or fresh fruit. Pretty simple. One cup, one cup equivalent. One large banana or orange is a cup equivalent. One small apple is a cup of equivalent. And a half a cup of dried fruit, dates, raisins. This is because they're more concentrated. Um, that represents a cup uh, equivalent of fruit. So if a patient has a cup of orange juice in the morning and then has a cup of fresh fruit uh, along with some yogurt, and then has a large banana, you could say that that patient has consumed three cup equivalent of fruit. Go on to the website again and look over uh, the variety of other possible foods that are being recommended by the myplate.gov website. So here's a question. How many meat and alternate ounce equivalents are found in one cup of beans three ounces of meat and two tablespoons of peanut butter. So remember, a quarter cup of beans is equal to one ounce equivalent. So we have one cup, that's four ounce equivalents of, of, uh, of meat or protein. Three ounces of meat, that's one ounce equivalent of protein for, um, for one ounce of meat. So three ounces would mean three. So three added to the four, that's seven. And then we have two tablespoons of peanut butter, remembering that one tablespoon is one ounce equivalent. So the answer is we have uh, is D, nine ounce equivalent uh, of protein. So I encourage you to practice more with the guide by going to the choosemyplate.gov, follow the instructions in the textbook of how to get there, and review the various foods in the various, um, um, in the various food groups uh, and the servings, and try to become very efficient and proficient at looking at the number of foods and, and how many 
ounce equivalent or cup equivalent that a patient perhaps uh, might be consuming. So practice just as we did here. You know, a patient has a cup of cereal, has two cups of rice, and then come from, and using that, derive the number of uh, ounce equivalent of breads and cereal, for instance, that the patient would have consumed. So this is something that you need to become very proficient at, and I will quiz you on this with the rapid response quiz to make sure that you're properly prepared and that you have a successful concept check one. So up next are a set of practice questions uh, on the MyPlate food guide that will help you better prepare for the rapid response quiz. In this first question, you could say while taking a 24-hour recall, the patient admits to eating the following over one day. One cup of bran flakes, two whole wheat toasts, two cups of rice for lunch, and three cups of spaghetti for dinner. Identify the total number of ounce equivalent of bread and cereal. So let's start counting. One cup of bran flakes is one. Two whole wheat toasts is two. So that's three together. Two cups of rice, that's um, the equivalent of four, so we have seven ounce equivalent. Three cups of rice, that's six, so seven and six, 13 ounce equivalent. Next question, a patient admits that over the last 24 hours, he consumed one scrambled egg, a half cup of Romano beans, two tablespoons of peanut butter, three ounces of sirloin steak and two ounces of fish determine the total um, ounce equivalent of protein foods. So let's do the counting. So the first is uh, one scrambled egg. So that's one ounce equivalent of protein. A half a cup of Romano beans is basically two, right? One quarter cup is one equivalent. So a half a cup is two one quarter cups. So now we have three ounce equivalents, two tablespoons of peanut butter, that's adding on two more, so that's five, and then uh, we have three ounces of sirloin steak, that's eight, and then we have two ounces of fish, that's two more added on to the eight, and the answer is 10 ounce equivalent. Next question, a patient admits to consuming the following over a 24 hour period, two cups of mixed vegetables, frozen more than likely or fresh, one cup of uh, um, V8 juice, one cup of carrots, two cups of raw spinach, one cup of cooked navy beans, and uh, two cups of mashed sweet potatoes. Identify the total number of vegetable cup equivalent. All right, let's start counting. Two cups of mixed vegetables, so one cup of vegetables is one um, cup equivalent, so we have two cup equivalents. One cup of VH juice, uh, that's another, so that's three cup equivalents. One cup of carrots, that's another, so that's four. Two cups of raw spinach, so two cups of raw spinach, that's one equivalent, so that's five. One cup of cooked navy beans, so that's basically one, so we've got six and two cup of mashed sweet potatoes. Uh, so one cup of uh, mashed potatoes is one, so we add on to that, that's eight uh, cup equivalents. In this question, if you assess during a 24-hour recall that a patient ate the following, two cups of raisin bran cereal, a half a cup of raisins, one large banana, two whole wheat toasts, how many fruit and cereal servings equivalent did they consume over breakfast? Well, the answer would likely be A, two fruit equivalent. Indeed, a half a cup of raisins is one, one large banana is one, so that's your two fruit equivalent. And then four ounce equivalent of breads. One cup of bran cereal is one serving, so you have two there, and you have two whole wheat toasts. That's a total of four ounce equivalent of bread and cereal. Finally, the last question, if a patient admits to eating uh, over one day, one cup of orange juice, two cups of fruit cup, two small apples, and one large banana, identify the total fruit cup equivalent. Well, let's begin. One cup of orange juice is one, two cups of fruit is two, so that's three together, two small apples, that's five, and one large banana, that's six, so that's six 
cup equivalent. All right, so what is next? So first, practice the food guide, the choosemyplate.gov. Go in and increase your proficiency uh, following the same sort of questions that we did previously and become very, very good at it. Uh, this is very much needed in order to successfully pass the rapid response quiz number, two, number one. Memorize the adult macronutrient ranges for food um, uh, that is um, needed for good health that is found in table 1.2 in your textbook. You should be able to understand also what the requirements are for saturated fat and for polyunsaturated fat. And then third, read the chapters twice or the chapter twice so that you may integrate a comprehensive narrative of nutrition in human health. And what this means is that you should be able on your own to tell a little bit of the story uh, of the history, the historical background be behind um, malnutrition in the United States, chronic disease in the United States.